Hi, this is a review for Biology 150, which is human biology. Specifically, this is, I believe, test four. All right, so with that in mind, this is going to be specifically on the autonomic nervous system, the endocrine system, the circulatory system, and generally speaking, blood flow. All right, so I will say the following. As I look at my notes, the vast majority of things I've written down that I plan to ask you on your exam, they come out of the circulatory system and blood chapters. All right. Not saying not to focus on other things. I'm just telling you the vast majority of what I've personally written down is coming out of circulatory system and blood and that sort of material of that fashion. So first things first, I have the autonomic nervous system. Now in the world of the autonomic nervous system, if I were you, I would know about the sympathetic division versus the parasympathetic division. I would understand that the autonomic nervous system is under control of the hypothalamus. So in and of this, grasp that the hypothalamus will dictate general functions of the autonomic nervous system and all of its underlying control measures. I uh, know that the sympathetic division is our fight or flight response, sort of rousing the body for action, whereas the parasympathetic division uh, would be what we might call rest and digest, calming the body down, relaxing you a little bit. Um, now, I will say the following, very little tissue in your system is uh, capable of producing hormones. You actually have very, very little, though those hormones go a long way. So they have a lot of function built into them. So a little bit of hormone does a lot for you, but you actually do not contain a lot of tissues that make hormones. Now, amongst this, we'll talk a little bit about the endocrine system itself. Uh, a sizable portion of your exam, a sizable portion of your exam is simply comparing a neural function to endocrine function. Probably at least 20 points on this exam uh, will have a variety of questions and then two answer choices. Is it neural or is it endocrine? So what you have to ask yourself is, is it caused by hormones, which would be the endocrine system, or is it caused by your brain and spinal cord sending messages? That would be neural. So there were numerous examples given of things that are driven by the neural divisions versus the endocrine divisions and you can guarantee I'll be asking you a number of those on this exam. So generally speaking, were I you, I would be able to compare and contrast neural versus endocrine stimulations. Uh, tell me about endocrine glands versus exocrine glands. So which ones have ducts and which ones are considered ductless glands? Uh, tell me about how your endocrine glands and your endocrine system make hormones. And amongst those hormones, tell me about how they can have lasting effects by, compared to, by comparison to the nervous system. Um, I spoke of numerous hormones during these lectures that are all fair game on this exam. In particular, I would know all about growth hormone, like what happens if you don't have enough, what happens if you have too much. Tell me about insulin. Uh, tell me about how insulin and the hormone glucagon are related to our dietary intake of sugar. So if you have a lot of sugar in your blood, what would you release? If you have very little sugar in your blood comparatively, what would you release? Insulin versus glucagon. And walk me through what happens in diabetes. Now, listen up, folks. I find this to be an incredibly important topic is diabetes. So I would know what causes diabetes, types one and type two. I would know all about those types. I would know about the interplay uh, between how our diet might influence this. Like what do terms like upregulation and downregulation mean in terms of insulin receptors? I understand that uh, your kidneys have what we call a transport maximum that helps them to uh, regulate sugar within the blood in some ways. So basically, uh, if you have too much sugar in your blood, uh, that will begin to leave through the kidneys as urine, and that will cause all sorts of other problems, polydipsia, polyphagia, what have you. So your kidneys play a role not just in fluid regulation, but in the regulation of all sorts of other solutes within the bloodstream. All right, that'll do. Uh, next is the circulatory system. Uh, let's see here, what all do I have for you? Uh, if I were you, I would understand, generally speaking, the full circuit of blood through the heart and around the body, all right? What do I mean when I say pulmonary circuit? What do I mean when I say systemic circuit? Tell me about how blood comes in the superior and inferior vena cava. Tell me about how it enters 
uh, the right atrium, goes into the right ventricle, how it's pumped from there to the lungs into the pulmonary circuit, how it comes back to the left atrium, and then leaves the left ventricle to go out to the entire body. I mean, think about the concept there. So in terms of the pulmonary circuit versus the systemic circuit, almost all of your blood's hanging out in the systemic circuit. Very little is actually flowing to the pulmonary circuit at any given period of time. And for that matter, uh, think about arteries versus veins. So you probably recall that the veins are a lot larger in diameter than are the arteries. And as a result of that, most of the blood in the body is hanging out in veins. Just have a grasp of these structures somewhat of how they're put together. Uh, understand your capillaries and that your capillaries are quite leaky, so they leak out fluid that becomes extracellular fluid, and this is the uh, way in which we exchange nutrients between tissues in the body. And understand how your lymphatic system works to take up excess tissue fluid using these lymphatic capillaries to keep your system from having swellings that we might call an edema, if that sounds familiar to you. Uh, yeah, all right, so walk me through the circulatory system, pulmonary versus systemic circuit. Uh, tell me all about capillaries and how they're going to be associated with uh, fluid exchange and how they're very small. Tell me about your arteries. Tell me why they have elastic tissue in them, uh, in essence, so that they can take extremely high pressure values. Like, for instance, uh, when heart, when heart, when blood leaves your heart, it's at the highest pressure it will ever be. So when blood enters into your aorta, it's at an extraordinary high, extraordinarily high level of pressure. Whereas when blood is finally returning to the heart at the um, uh, superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, it's at an extremely low pressure by comparison. So just have a grasp that your arteries are very elastic so that they can handle the pressure that's flowing into them. Uh, tell me about how veins have valves and why veins have valves. I'll give you a hint. This deals with the low pressure blood they have flowing through them and how backflow as a result of gravity can be a problem. So help me understand how you get blood back to the heart from the venous networks uh, if the heart's pressure itself is not quite enough to do so. All right, let me see what else I've got for you here, folks. Uh, just give me a moment. All right, path of blood through the, through the heart. The heart chambers, and tell me about which chambers are different in size. So the right ventricle versus the left ventricle, which one's bigger and why? Uh, tell me about how your heart is surrounded by a parietal pericardium and a visceral pericardium, and why your heart is surrounded by a parietal pericardium and a visceral pericardium. Uh, walk me through what blood pressure is. So systolic pressure versus diastolic pressure. What does this mean? So what is the pressure during systole? What is the pressure during diastole? Uh, and for that matter, what would hypertension, right? What would hypertension look like? That's high blood pressure. And why is high blood pressure a problem, okay? Worthy of considering. Again, a lot of this class is helping you understand sort of the meaningful aspects of health in our systems. So having a grasp of what high blood pressure looks like and why we worry about it is in fact quite meaningful. All right, let's see here. So pulmonary versus systemic circuit in detail. Uh, you can guarantee that I'm gonna have a nice big paragraph walking you through where blood goes in the body, and I'm going to expect you to be able to tell me where everything ends up. So expect to walk me through the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. Tell me about the valves involved. Like give me the whole detail, all right, all the details. Uh, let's see here. What there, uh, I will also ask you a variety of issues related to the heart. So tell me what an aneurysm is. Tell me what an embolism is. Tell me what a heart attack looks like. What are stents? What would a bypass surgery be? Like tell me about heart-based issues because this is one of the major killers in our society. So I think it's worthy that you have a grasp of it. All right. In your whole blood, there's basically two parts, and that is the formed elements, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, and then there's the plasma, plasma being mostly water. So tell me about red blood cells, which we also, also call erythrocytes and what they're for. Tell me about white blood cells, which we also call leukocytes and somewhat of what they're for. Like, what's an example of a disease where you're producing entirely too many leukocytes that could be very much problematic, uh, causing the blood to, in essence, lose function? What do I mean when I say something like formed elements, all right? Uh, walk me through some of the development of blood cells, like what's a megakaryocyte? These are all fair game, okay? 
Uh, let's see here. Oh, in terms of white blood cells, tell me about how they're capable of leaving the blood and moving through your tissues through a process we call diapetesis, if you recall. Uh, tell me about how platelets help you clot blood. So all of these things are fair game. All right. Uh, there are numerous medical conditions that we talked about throughout these chapters, and I find them to be incredibly important. So were I you, I would go through these medical conditions and just have a grasp of them. So tell me what jaundice is. Like, what does jaundice mean? Is it a condition on its own, or is it a side effect of some other condition? How would you diagnose a person as having jaundice? What's leukemia? How would you diagnose a person as having leukemia? What would their blood look like by comparison to a normal individual? Tell me about hemophilia and how hemophilia is primarily seen in males. That is a sex-linked trait because it follows on the X chromosome and what that means. So who gets hemophilia? And for that matter, tell me about blood clotting with hemophilia. Is it a possibility? Like what are the effects of hemophilia? Uh, walk me through blood typing. So if you've got type A blood, what sort of antigens are present on your red blood cells? What sort of antibodies would you make? Uh, if you th type B blood, the same story. Like who's a universal donor? Who's a universal recipient? But understand that all we're talking about here is if you're type AB positive, that means you have A antigens and B antigens and you're positive for the rhesus factor. Like have a grasp of these blood types and somewhat of what they mean. All right, let me see what else I've got here. And uh, be able to explain to me the hemolytic disease of newborns. So back in the day, we used to blood test folks before they could get married. Uh, just have a grasp that hemolytic disease is a real thing. Like, tell me what Rogam is, this shot we give uh, to moms that are rhesus negative, and they have a child that's rhesus positive. So just give me a general idea of somewhat of how that works. Uh, I think I mentioned Parkinson's disease a little bit during these conversations. So tell me about Parkinson's disease. Tell me about dopamine upregulation versus downregulation. Kind of like insulin upregulation and downregulation. And what Parkinson's disease is. And then, last but not least, and very much worthy of our consideration here, the five questions. I made a point previously that you have to know your five questions in detail before you start these exams. Having a really firm grasp of the five questions, the five paragraphs I ask you to answer prior to the exam, and I do mean paragraphs, if you're giving me one or two sentences, I'm going to stop giving credit. Those five paragraphs, if you know those answers verbatim, if you understand what you wrote down, all right, you have a great chance of doing well on this exam. Uh, and with that in mind, that's where I'm going to stop this thing, so I hope this helps. Make sure and pull the transcript from this and use it as a question and answer type format. Uh, and good luck. I hope you do fantastically well. Have a nice day.